remember I had things put in my head in the mid 80s that because I wasn't light skinned, I wasn't that it girl. On campus, I was the it girl. But honey, I was a size two with big gazumbas and big old hips. No ass though. You know, I hadn't bought it yet. I don't hear nobody out there. bugs hello there bellas if you have not already done so please remember to like share to facebook subscribe and visit uptopbeauty.com i'm looking down there in the comments and y'all is burning me up because y'all like nay you need to up your inventory okay okay i hear you i am working on it but that doesn't mean that if you haven't bought anything from uptopbeauty.com that you shouldn't go over there and check it out. The next thing is for all my old and new paid book club members. I appreciate you for all you do and sacrifice for me every month. And if you are not already a part of this book club, please hit the Patreon link below and or the join button here on the YouTube. And for a small monthly fee of $5, you babies. Yes, you should be privy to all the shenanigans before the YouTube gets it, if the YouTube gets it. Now, now, now. Let's continue talking about Faith Evans. Keep the faith. I began seeing more and more of William as we worked together. And our professional relationship turned into a personal relationship. I was 17. William was 35. And he was married. William had continually urged me to leave JT alone, which I did. But I traded JT's drama for Williams. Before long, I was in way over my head. I was dating William, a married man, and I would have to go to his basement studio for rehearsals while his wife was upstairs. Okay, pause. So I'm about to say something that I know is going to, um, you know, make people sour a little towards me, but I'm just giving you honesty, all right? I've said before that I have dated a married man before in my uh, younger years, all right? And outside of my wife, that was probably the longest relationship that I've ever had. The secret to me is just don't go nowhere, all right? Because if you back away, honey, then I'm going to forget about you. But if you're always there, then you're always there. I was just talking to someone who is in a relationship with a married man. And I explained to her that I have no judgment towards her because there is no passion that you will ever feel in a lifetime, in 13 lifetimes, like the passion that you feel when you're messing with a married man. Because them single ones, Child, they don't even pull the blicker out. But the married ones will unload the clip on your ass. Eventually, other members of the group found out what was going on. But I thought I was grown. In my mind, I knew that dating someone who'd taken marriage vows would come back to haunt me at some other time. I didn't take it that seriously. But I knew I would have to pay the price for that indiscretion. A few times, William and I teamed up to perform for weddings. I would sing, you and I, or the Lord's Prayer while he played the music for the processional and the recessional. I had already started singing at weddings, funerals, and the occasional retirement party. William was a professional musician, and I believe he thought that with my songwriting and vocal talents, we could be sort of a team. I was willing to try it out. 
but I continued to write and produce with Tyrone as well. At one point, William told me I should meet with Stuart Levy, an entertainment attorney who was well known in the music industry. William and I drove into Manhattan one day after school and Stuart Levy welcomed us into his office. He was very warm and friendly. He was a big guy, really tall. He had a wide smile and oversized glasses. I like your demo, he said. It sounds really good. I can't promise you anything, but I'll definitely keep you in mind if projects cross my desk. Stewart called me a few weeks later. Would you like to sing background vocals for a record, he asked. Absolutely, I said, grabbing a notepad and a pencil. There's a group on Jive Records called High Five. They need a vocalist to do some backing vocals. Can you be at the studio tomorrow at 8? I'm there. Now, is yous. Yous the one that tells me. I love my book club. I love y'all. I love you. I love you. But yous the one that told me that Faith was singing background on all of these records. I had no idea. But when I think about it, Faith is so good at what she does and how her voice is so melodic that she could. Remember when we read the Pointer Sisters book and we found out that the Pointer Sisters, when they weren't on stage and touring, that they were still getting their money from doing background vocals? I like that. I really do like that because when you have a voice, you still got to work. You don't just sit around. Y'all told me that the, the name of the song was Heartbreak Hotel, something like that. Since you had a ride, da, 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 something like that with the song with Kelly Price, Faith Evans, and um, Whitney Houston. How dare me say and um, okay? But all three of them were background vocalists. First, so the way that Faith handled things was, although she was singing the background vocals on some very popular songs, she wasn't even thinking about the fact that this could lead to something. She saw it as an opportunity to learn the business. She has one of those airy voices that you respect. Ah, uh, y'all might be mad at me, but that goddamn Aaliyah. And that Janet Jackson, them some airy voices that you'd be like, oh, I could tell they worked with a vocal coach really a long time, a long, long time. I was in the middle of my senior year, and besides music, my thoughts were preoccupied with SATs, college applications, prom, and graduation. Toward the end of my senior year, I got a check from AFTRA for $600 for the work I'd done on the High Five record. I was thrilled. It was my first time being officially paid for my singing talents. I was still in high school. I did make a little money at the time. I set up a salon in my grandmother's kitchen. I would hook up the weaves and acrylic nails of the girls in my hood. I graduated with a 3.8 grade point average and had applied to a number of top ranked schools. I was accepted into Fordham University, which had everything I wanted. It was close to home. I had no desire to live on campus because I feared being broke. Word. It had a good reputation and it was in New York City, but it was also expensive. Over 25000 a year, and I had no idea how I was going to pay for it. I'm sure I would have qualified for some kind of financial aid, but I didn't know much about how to go about applying for it. I was proud that I made it to college. I never really got into the whole college life scene, though. It was okay, but I was way too ambitious and driven for college parties and pillow fights. <laughs> Let me tell you what kind of college student I was the first time I went to call my first semester. No, 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 no. My first year. Okay? Because my mama worked at the school that I went to college at. Oh, shit. <laughs> UDC, we had this, like, 
concrete platform area that we call the plaza. Oh, shit. So it would be so much fun on the plaza that I ended up not going to class. That's how fun it was on the plaza. It was just so much fun. And most of the reason why people were on the plaza was because it was a whole bunch of people from all over the city, southeast, northeast, northwest, southwest, coming to UDC's plaza to hang out and pick up girls, okay? Because so, it was mostly the dudes, all right, hanging out there, and you know me being young, dumb. I was there looking for attention also. I was getting my degree, but I was more so enjoying the, enjoying the attention that I was receiving because, honey, believe it or not, I was a size two, big ass hips, big ass titty. I ain't even had no ass. I actually didn't realize that I was attractive until I got in college. And that's crazy. And I think it was because I knew I wasn't unattractive. But remember, I had things put in my head in the mid 80s that because I wasn't light skinned, I wasn't that it girl. On campus, I was the it girl. But honey, I was a size two with big ass gazumbas and big old hips. No ass though. You know, I hadn't bought it yet. And honey, we used to have so much fun, right? And I could be talking, me and, because BFF was there for a couple of semesters with me too. Child, I could be talking, blah, blah, blah. And then somebody would be like, nay, there go your mother. I'd be like, oh, fuck, there go my mama. She would walk up on me on the plaza bullshitting. Nay, why you not in class? Uh, I, I, uh, it got to the point where when I was in class, my mother would walk past the class to see if I was in the class. It was so cute, y'all. She would go to the door and be like, Nay, Nay, come here. She knew my schedule, the son of a bitch. I would make my own schedule. I wouldn't communicate that to her because I didn't have to, okay? But she knew my schedule. She would come and she'd be like, come here. I had a full schedule of classes and my days were consumed with getting out to the Bronx for class, studying, writing papers, practicing with the gospel group that my then boyfriend produced for and hanging out with my friends. One afternoon, I was on my way to Penn Station to catch the train to Fordham. I was in the spring semester near the end of my first year in school. I was wearing one of my infamous champion fleece sweatsuits that I wore all the time back then. That's because you had to rely on your looks back then. You had to be able to be cute with none of this makeup on, none of this hair. Now, don't get me wrong. We did do slight things. It was called tracks then. We were putting tracks in our hair. You all use tracks to create wigs, but we would put a piece like to cover our eye and the rest of it be shaved or um, if we were wearing some kind of bob or something like that, but it wasn't wig. We was wearing tracks, okay? It wasn't the glorious feats that they're doing now with hair. Okay, so you basically had to rely on your pure, naturally grown from your mammy and your pappy looks. We used to wear in high school back in the day, wear sweatsuits as girls. We used to make sure we had nice sneakers on and just buy us a plain crew neck sweatshirt and some joggers. That's what we relied on. And when we dressed up, honey, so basically, that you could wear back in the day if you was like an average girl, not if your brother was a drug dealer or your daddy was a drug dealer. Maybe you would have on some New Balance, uh, a Gap sweatshirt. You would have your hair done, cow, 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 some kind of asymmetric style, a gold chain, um, and um, a coach bag or MCM. That's if you were average. Now, if you was above average, then you would probably have more like a Gucci, uh, some Gucci sneakers, 
and a Gucci sweatsuit or a Sergio Ticini sweatsuit with some Sergio Ticini uh, sneakers. Uh, of course, whether you were broke or not, you still had on like those bamboo earrings, you know, at least two pair, and your hair done. So it didn't require much to be fly back then or at least decent oh honey okay so we talking about the super fly betty's damn they wasn't wearing just the coach bags and the mcms them girls had chanel's that's because their boyfriends was either drug dealers their big brothers was either drug dealers or their pappy was a drug dealer you know i i i'm i fell like right in between those two sets, average and the super fly. We had to rely on our looks, our real looks, our real hair, all of that. Because if you put all the hair on then and wore all that makeup, oh, they would tear your ass up. You hear me? We couldn't have no eyelashes on, some mascara, but they would burn your ass up if you stepped out the house looking like how these girls look now. But man, I mean, it's your life, not mine. I ran into someone who looked familiar, a fellow musician named Kiyama Griffin. I didn't know him well, but I knew his name and that most people called him. I'm not sure if it's Ki or Kai, because it could be Kiyama. Kiyama. I don't know. I, don't I knew know. that he'd played keyboard in the jazz band at... We Quahic High School, which was near my house. I sang with the jazz band at University High School and our high school had performed together a time or two. I also knew that he had a bit of a connection to the music industry. He was part of a production crew called Three Boys from Newark. They'd become local celebrities due to their work with an R&B singer named Christopher Williams, who'd had some success in the early 90s. At Penn Station, Kai and I exchanged a bit of small talk.